start a minute early. So welcome to uh, Caribbean Island Ecology. Your main lecturer and course coordinator is Michael Odom. Uh, my name is Star, um, and I will be lecturing to you a little bit. But I'm uh, I'm not the uh, I'm not the main event in this course by any means. So I want to just get you very briefly oriented or on, on a couple of things. Uh, one thing that uh, you are well advised to do is to get accustomed with an awful lot of islands. Uh, I'm going to help you with that uh, today with a sort of a travel log of the islands of the world, but especially the islands of the West Indies. And I believe Mike is putting on the wire on your e-learning a double-sided sheet on the, uh, the main islands of the West Indies, everything larger than 60 square kilometers. So you should carry this with you. Make a copy of it, carry it with you, take a look at it every now and then. Um, and, um, and, and also a, a map. Uh, I believe there's also a map that he can put up there. So get used to where all of the islands are. So that when in lecture we mention a particular island, you can already picture where it is. Um, it's, it's something, uh, but, but bring it to you by, uh, bring it to you, uh, with you to class by all means. And so, you should know a number of things about many of the islands, especially in the West Indies, roughly how big it is, its geological origin, whether it's volcanic or, uh, or coralline, uh, its topography. So for instance, Dominica is a very mountainous island. That's important to understanding what Dominica is all about. On the other hand, quite near Dominica is Marie Galante, which is very flat makes a big difference in island ecology. Something about the climate, um, including hurricanes, seasonality, uh, patterns of biodiversity, human population, and something about the government and the main, um, the main economic activities. Now, human beings tend to find islands really, really fascinating. You see a lot of these North American and European tourists come down here, and they could, if they, if they wanted a tropical vacation, I mean, they're no fools, they come in the wintertime, when it's winter up north. Uh, they could just as well go to Costa Rica or Belize or uh, French Guiana, uh, but there's a, a very high prevalence in coming to the West Indies, specifically because they are islands. And the thing that fascinates people about islands is their apartness. Um, the uh, great uh, Trinidadian writer Sam Selvin uh, has a book uh, titled an, an Island is a World. And that's pretty much it because you, they, they've got well-defined boundaries. Um, and so uh, that's also what makes them of interest to biologists. Uh, so that you've got a world, a, a world by itself here with its own biota and you've got another one here and you've got another one here, you've got replication. So those are just uh, some of the, the points to which I want you to pay attention as we go along. Right now what I'm going to do, now let's see, Mike, um, I don't think we need to turn off the, uh, the lights, do we? What do you reckon? Is it good enough? Like that? Okay, Let, let's, let's continue with this. We'll, we'll turn them off if we come to anything really difficult, but I don't think there will. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a quick travel log of the world. And uh, we're going to take a look at some of these islands, uh, some of which will become much more familiar to you as we go al along. So let's start with this continent down at the bottom of the world. And this is, of course, Antarctica, a great big place. And Antarctica is ringed with a whole lot of islands, sub-Antarctic islands. And as you would expect, these islands are relatively cold, they're windy, their biodiversity is low, and they are separate places by themselves. So there are the sub-Antarctic islands, there you see Africa. This is just looking, you know, from the southern pole. Africa, Australia, South America. Then we take another look, and this one shows some of the sub There's Antarctica again, and this shows many of the sub-Antarctic islands fairly well, so that you see that 
at their southern ends, some of these continents actually come fairly close to Antarctica. Now let's go and take a look at the north end. Looking from the north down on, on, the, uh, on the globe. And you see here it's exactly the opposite. So instead of a continent uh, surrounded by islands, what you've got is an ocean, the Arctic Ocean, with a whole lot of islands around it. So there are a lot of Arctic islands as well. And of course there's Greenland, which is practically a continent uh, in itself although we, we tend to treat it as an island. Okay, now here, here's a pair of islands with which I'm sure you're familiar. These are the, the British Isles, and you see, no, I guess you don't. Let's try this. Okay, um, and here you see England and Scotland and Wales, and there is Ireland. Now I'm gonna try to run this with out that as much as possible and sometimes uh, one speaks of Britain as a small country in fact it's a, it's actually a fairly large populous place but there you see a group of islands that are set off from the continent by relatively narrow stretches people sometimes swim uh, between uh, Britain and France and of course if they get to France they don't go back to England they're no fools Okay, yes, I think we can see this. So here we see the Mediterranean Sea, and you should also be familiar with the main islands in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, here are the Balearic Islands of Spain, um, Corsica, uh, no, Sardinia and Corsica. Uh, here is um, Sicily, off of the boot of, um, of um, Italy. And you see there's a very narrow strait in between. Some of the others here is Crete, um, Cyprus. So look at maps. Be familiar with the main islands there. Now, here we've got the Iberian Peninsula. We're now gonna look out here. And we look out here and what we see is some other groups of islands. So way off here out in the ocean are the Azores, which are administered by Portugal. And further down, uh, okay, the Madeira Islands here, also administered by Portugal. And you see they are off of, in the Atlantic, off of Africa. And now we're gonna take another look at that. Okay, the Madeira Islands, still up there. But further south, we've got the Canary Islands, administered by Spain. So these are islands that are um, fringing Africa to one degree or another. Now, so here you see Africa and up there you see the Azores and the Canary Island, the Madeira and the Canary Islands. These ones right here is, is the Cape Verde Islands. We're not going to treat them, but take a look at these ones out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, right on the mid-Atlantic Ridge. And these include the remotest island uh, in the world. So here is, let me make sure I get this right. Yes, this is Ascension Island. This is St. Helena, where Napoleon was, um, was exiled. And down here is, are, is supposedly the remotest island in the world. That is to say, the one that is farthest from the nearest continent. This is Tristan da Cunha. Tri Tristan da Cunha. You know the name Tristan? Da Cunha. C-U-N-H-A. It's, it's just plain Portuguese. What's the problem? <laughs> and a little wee volcanic island. Uh, very remote. I mean, I really want to go there someday. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to come down further. Here you see South America. There's Antarctica again. We're gonna come down here to the Falkland Islands. Um, when you're speaking Spanish, it is uh, polite to refer to them as the Islas Malvinas uh, because they are claimed by Argentina. And Argentina has a very good case, but the English have more guns. Uh, so the, it's administered now by, by Britain. 
But uh, I always, when speaking English, I call them the Falkland Islands. When I'm speaking Spanish, I call them the uh, Islas Malvinas. And if people don't like it, well, that's, that's their, their problem. But there you see where it is. Um, and here is uh, Tierra del Fuego, down here. So it's off in the Atlantic. Let's take a closer look at them. There they are. And uh, they look very fragmented. There are actually a whole lot of islands. And you would expect, you saw where they are. They're not quite sub-Antarctic, but almost. So you would expect that it's cold and windy there. Uh, and that um, it's, uh, it's not, not forested. I think the English there grow sheep mostly. Um, uh, but that's, um, it's in between, um, in between uh, sub-Antarctic and, uh, and the, uh, the mid-Atlantic islands. Okay, now we're gonna go way up north. No, pardon me, there we go. Now, very often we think of, here are the Bahamas, here's Florida, of course, we think of Bermuda as part of the West Indies, but if you look at it, Bermuda is actually off of the Carolinas, off in the, uh, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Now, this is, this is exaggerated. They're not really that big. Uh, this, is, this is for emphasis. But you see where they are out there. And uh, you uh, would expect, as you get to know island ecology better, you would expect them to be relatively depauperate in their biota, and you'd be right about that. So they're physically uh, not very different from many of the, uh, the West Indies, and especially the Bahamas. Okay, now let's take a look at the islands. Uh, we're going to uh, largely leave these aside for now because that's going to be your main topic. But let's take a look at the Galapagos Islands. Galapagos is a word meaning tortoise, and they are known for their great big tortoises. And this is, as you see, out in the ocean, um, far from a continent. Uh, they're tropical islands, and so they have very high endemism. You're going to be, you're going to get to be very familiar with that term, endemism. It means that the species found in the Galapagos Islands are for the most part found nowhere else on Earth. And of course that makes them very vulnerable to, uh, to extinction. And let's take a closer look. There are the Galapagos Islands. And they've got um, uh, each, they, they each have a pair of names. One given by the English and then, and then another, um, uh, uh, the, the name, preferred name now, which is, uh, tends to be Spanish. Uh, they are administered by Ecuador. Okay, now, so there, here, let's, let's take a look at where we were. Okay, there we are. Now we're going to go way down here to the island of Australia. And uh, Australia is sometimes treated as an island, sometimes a continent. It's just a matter of words. Uh, so you shouldn't worry about what to call it, just worry about what it's like. And Australia, as I'm sure you know, has very high endemism. And you think of the, the mammals of Australia, a whole lot of marsupials. Uh, we don't have very many marsupials here in the, uh, in the New World. So that um, you find a, a native species anywhere in Australia, chances are it is uh, unique uh, to Australia, or at least to the Australia group of islands. Now down here you see Tasmania. Tasmania is closer to the South Pole, so you expect it to be cooler, and you expect that to have an effect on its biota, and you'll be right. Let's take a look at it, Tasmania. Okay, so there's, there's Tasmania. Also um, has a very, very high degree of endemism. The uh, Tasmanian wolf was a, um, uh, is an extinct, um, extinct uh, a marsupial predator, um, so-called, because although it's not related to wolves, it looked like, sort of like a small wolf. The Tasmanian tiger you've heard of has nothing to do with tigers. It's it just, it's got, it's got stripes on it. Uh, it's actually in, in, uh, in some difficulty now. So there's Tasmania, and you can no longer see Australia, which is, is off of the map. Okay, now back here, okay, so we're in Australia. 
What we're going to do now is you see that tip of an island coming down up there. That's the tip of New Guinea. We're now going to go to New Guinea. Great big island. There it is in red. You see the tip of Australia. This tip here, this is, this is Queensland. Very tropical. Much of Australia is uh, very, very arid and has a, a temperate climate. Queensland it has a climate more similar to, uh, to our own island. So there's New Guinea, great big island, very mountainous, very high degree of endemism. And incidentally, there are about uh, 5,000 languages spoken in the world today. Uh, I think about 1,500 of them are from New Guinea. And just a very, because of the topography and the tribal society, very highly fragmented. And so the people in this valley, they speak a language different from the people over in that valley over there. And uh, especially if they've been at war with them for generations, they can't understand each other. Uh, they, need, they need the United Nations. Okay, now let's go up here. And what we're gonna look at now is the Sunda Islands. And the Sunda Islands, well, let's take a, a close, closer look at them. Okay, so here, here's Australia again. There's New Guinea. The Sunda Islands are um, Sumatra, Java, Borneo, and a bunch of little islands that stretch out here. These are commonly known as the Lesser Sunda Islands. I don't especially expect you to put that in your active vocabulary, but when somebody mentions the Lesser Sunda Islands, and especially if you're on Jeopardy, okay, uh, you, you know, you want to you ace that. It does not include Sulawesi or Celebes and does not include the islands over here, nor does it include the Philippines. So that's what is meant by the Sunda Islands, so-called because they lie on the Sunda continental shelf. So the seas around them are relatively shallow. On the other hand, here is I've approximately drawn the Sahul Shelf, S-A-H-U-L, which is another continental shelf. And uh, so during times, during ice ages, when a lot of water is drawn out of the, uh, the, the, the sea and the sea level drops, then you could walk from here to here, or you could walk from here to here, um, if you're feeling vigorous. Okay, now I want to pay attention to this area here. Here is Sumatra. Here's Java. That's the um, that, that's the there's South continental Southeast Asia up there. So right in here is a very special group of islands, and these are the Krakatau Islands. Now, in 1883, it seems like just yesterday. In 1883, which, I mean, you can remember because it's the same year the Orient Express made its first run from Paris to Istanbul. Why are you nodding? You didn't know that. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, I knew that. Mm, sure, anyhow, there was a huge volcanic explosion in the area in between Sumatra and Java. And there were already islands there, but they were largely destroyed and new islands were made, new volcanic islands out of hot rocks and dust. Well, naturally, and, and they have for the most part persisted, they're still there. Where very often new volcanic islands appear and if they, 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 they get washed away if they're mostly made of, of, of dust. But sometimes they do persist. And these ones did. So this is what it looks like today, the, uh, the Krakatau Islands. And this was treated as a biogeographic experiment because suddenly you had brand new islands and of course there was nothing on it. Nothing could live. It was, you know, just nothing but, you know, hot lava and dust. And so over the next years, uh, biologists kept going back there and seeing what had become established there. And sometimes something that was established one year would be, uh, would, would be lost a few years later. Already in 1886, just three years after the explosion, uh, it was broadly covered by ferns. 
and uh, that gives you uh, that that tips you off that ferns are very good at establishing establishing themselves on on very new islands. Uh, it took much longer for real trees and and for some things to get there. As you would expect, I mean, large mammals are still not there. Uh, they don't they don't cross uh, water barriers uh, very well. So I myself have never yet been to the uh, to to the Krakatau Islands, but. Uh, I very much want to. Okay, so there, uh, there it is again, the position of the Krakatau Islands. Borneo is a very exceptional island. It is, I think, the third largest island in the world, and it's got all kinds of juicy stuff on it. I'm afraid I was only there for a couple of weeks, but I very much would like to go there for a longer period. Well, let me, while we're at it, draw your attention to these islands in here. These are the Moluccas, M-O-L-U-C-C-A-S, also known as the Spice Islands. What do you suppose the Moluccas have to do with Grenada? What? Nutmeg. Okay, go to the head of the class. Yeah, nutmeg. That's where it comes from originally. Uh, supposedly, the nutmeg grown in, uh, in Grenada is of higher quality. Uh, or at least it was before the hurricane. I don't know if it's if it's recovered, but anyhow, these are the um, uh, these and Sulawesi are uh, in between the continental shelves, and uh, uh, we're going to probably in the very possibly in the very next lecture we'll come to the distinction between oceanic and continental islands, which is is very important. I should mention one other thing about Sulawesi or Celebes is that like some others it is actually a composite island it is formed by a number of smaller islands coming together and sticking together about eight to ten million years ago uh, so uh, that uh, that sometimes happens that um, an island uh, uh, either breaks apart or or comes together now let's go further north there you see the philippines up there let's go there now and here they are so the great big island is Luzon, and uh, here is Mindanao, the second biggest island of the Philippines. And in between, these islands are known as the Visayas Islands, um, and right down here is Palawan. Now Palawan and the associated smaller islands stand apart from the rest of the Philippines. I refer to the rest of the Philippines as the Philippines proper um, because Palawan and these smaller islands, like Borneo, sit on the Sunda shelf while the others do not. So what that means is that about 12,000 years ago, at the peak of the Ice Age, when a lot of water was drawn out of the oceans and the sea levels were lower, you could walk across there, but you couldn't walk to there. So what that means is that you would expect that Palawan would have a biota more similar to Borneo and the continent than would the Philippines proper, and you'd be right about that. Um, so for instance, on these, uh, you take for instance uh, tree shrews, which are kind of like very primitive primates. They exist here, I have seen them here. Nobody has ever seen them there, they're not there. Because the, the original tree shrews got here just by walking across because it was all part of a single continental area. While Celebes or Sulawesi was not part of it. Okay, let's go a little further north. Now we're gonna go north of, uh, well there you see the tip of Luzon and there are some islands up above it, but we're gonna go a little further north than that. No, oh, pardon me. And here, here are the Philippines, and here is Taiwan. So there you see Taiwan, which is a relatively mountainous island, um, separated not very far from, uh, the, um, from, the, from the Chinese mainland, and there are other smaller islands in between, so that island hopping organisms could conceivably go between them and in fact the biota of, uh, of Taiwan is not very different from that of the nearby uh, Chinese mainland. This, uh, this island down here 
is, uh, I think Hong Kong is about there. This island here is called uh, Hainan, um, and uh, it, um, it likewise, you would expect to have a biota similar to southern China, and you'd be right about that. While we're at it, there's, uh, there's Korea up there. We're gonna get to Japan, and so Japan will be off of here. But first, let me uh, show you a peculiar thing about, um, let's take the lights off for this one, about Taiwan. Now, look at this part along here. From space, it looks like that part is just sort of tacked on. And it is. Taiwan also is a composite island. Because remember, the Earth's crust is always in motion. It never sits still. And so this part of Taiwan was joined to the other when the two, uh, two came together. And so you look at that picture and you get a pretty good, a pretty good idea of what Taiwan is like. Very mountainous in the, in the, in the uh, beginning part, or the, uh, the, the middle part. A large coastal plain over here. And down here, it's subtropical. This is kind of like the Florida of Taiwan. This is the uh, Hungchen Peninsula, or Eternal Spring Peninsula. And it's subtropical, quite a bit different from that. While we're at it, let's take a look at these islands. This is Orchid Island, Lanyu. And this is Green Island, and these are out there, out fairly far out in the Pacific. Uh, very interesting places. Uh, I've uh, spent some very happy hours there. Um, okay, but we're not going to dwell on those. We're going to go further north. Let's take a look at Japan. Japan has a lot of similarities with Britain in many ways, including social and historical. But there you see you think of Japan as being a small country. Uh, it's not especially small. Uh, this is the, uh, the main island, Honshu. Uh, and you see that Japan stretches over a large latitudinal um, expanse. So that you would expect, and there are, there are further islands down, down here that um, are, are administered by Japan, in between Japan and, and, and Taiwan. And so you would expect that the climate down here in Kyushu to be quite different, especially from Hokkaido up in the north. And you'd be right about that. And as, you all, as you're all aware, uh, Japan is fairly mountainous. It's, uh, it's volcanic. Uh, and they have, they have earthquakes there all the time. Japanese school children are all very well drilled in earthquake, uh, earthquakes because it could happen at any time. Um, but it's, it's actually a, a fairly large place. Now, what I want to do next is to go out into the ocean. So here's Korea, remember? And uh, you see uh, there's the southern part of Siberia there. So we're going to go out here into the Pacific Ocean. And we're going to start looking at relatively remote Pacific Islands for the first time. And this allows you to get oriented because here's Australia, New Guinea, we've already seen. Here is New Zealand out here. And you've seen the Lord of the Rings. You have an idea of what the habitat is like in New Zealand. It's, uh, I guess you'd say it's, it's sort of like Northern California. Uh, it's cool, but it's relatively wet. Um, so it's got, it's got moist forests but they're not the kind of moist forests we have in the northern range. And there you see <coughs> the three divisions into which the Pacific Islands tend to be placed. And Melanesia and Micronesia are, uh, they're, they're sort of artificial constructs, but the terms are widely used. But Polynesia, look at the three, look at, look at the three um, points in the, um, in the triangle of Polynesia. Down here, New Zealand, the, the Maori of New Zealand are Polynesians. And over here, Easter Island. Okay, you've all heard of Easter Island, those whacking big uh, stone things. And up there, Hawaii. So the Hawaiian Islands are really quite remote. Mike is gonna be lecturing, I believe, on the Hawaiian Islands and what sets them apart. Uh, and uh, you know why their biota is very different, but their remoteness 
has a lot to do with it. And then in between all of these islands that you've seen in movies and travel logs, all uh, wonderful places, or at least they, uh, they used to be. We've got a student in our area, a graduate student from Tonga, uh, or as the Americans say, Tonga. Uh, okay, now let's uh, take another look at Polynesia. There we go. Pretty much says the same thing. So you've got the three, um, got the three points. Here's a, here's Pitcairn Island. Remember where they when they had the mutiny on the bounty and they uh, they uh, they stayed on Pitcairn Island. And uh, so out there in the Pacific, unlike in the South Atlantic, where you've just got a very small number of islands, the whole place is scattered with islands. And that tells you a lot about how the Pacific Islands, unlike the South Atlantic Islands, came to be so well populated. Because let's say somebody was in an, an island society and there was a, you know, a big split in the society or they were so prosperous that it got overpopulated and some people were driven out. Well, they would have noticed that there tended to be clouds in the horizon just about there. And as good seafarers, they knew that clouds tend to sit over islands. So they could be fairly sure that if they went out into the ocean, you know, took a roll of the dice, if they headed there, they'd likely find land and maybe land that would support them. So that um, after, um, you know, within a very small number of centuries, uh, virtually all of Polynesia came to be uh, populated. Okay, now we're going to go to the other side. And you all recognize India here. And here is Sri Lanka or Ceylon. And uh, you notice there's uh, just a, a short strait across. However, there is a mountainous, well forested area here and another in the center. And these are more separated from each other than this strait would suggest. So that the biota, the central biota, of Sri Lanka is more distinct from that of India uh, than, uh, than this would suggest. Now, I want to draw your attention to these islands here. and These are a wild place. The Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Let's take a look at them. And uh, these ones, uh, the, um, there are people there whom I think without insult we can call Stone Age people. They have resisted uh, coming into what we would regard as the main society. And so if you want to go there as a tourist, the Indian government will probably not allow it. Uh, both because they, wanted to, they, they, they don't want to uh, introduce illnesses to the people there and also for your own safety because the people there have got spears and they don't want you coming on their islands. So I'm told. I've never been there. But these are very distinct places with very distinct people and presumably very distinct um, uh, biotas. Okay, well, once again, here's India, the Indian subcontinent, and there's Ceylon or Sri Lanka down below. Let's take a look at Ceylon or Sri Lanka. And what I mentioned was there's this mountainous area here, which is very far distant from the mountainous part uh, of southern India. So what you would expect is that the lowlands biota here and in southern India would be more similar to each other than would be the mountainous, the mountain biota. And you'd be right about that. Okay, now let's go back here, okay. Now what, here's the Indian, pardon me, here's the Indian Ocean here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cross the Indian Ocean. And we're gonna go to Madagascar. Now Mike is gonna lecture on Madagascar, I believe. Very distinctive place. That's where lemurs come from. Um, extremely distinctive. And there, it looks like Madagascar used to just kind of fit into there, and it did. It's a continental island, but it has been separated from the main continent of Africa by about 75 million years. So that it has gone its own way. It has become a very distinctive place. And let's take another look at Madagascar just so you can put some color into it. But I'll tell you what, um, here. You notice that they don't show up very well in this picture, but north of Madagascar, there are other groups of islands 
that are off of the coast, the west coast of Africa. And here we go. Here are some of them. So the, uh, okay, so there are the Comoro Islands. Let's see, this doesn't show it as well as I would like. But the Comoro Islands are one of the groups off of the, uh, the west coast of Africa, the, pardon me, the east coast of Africa. Um, yeah, okay, so there you see where the Comoros are. They're in between the northern tip of uh, Madagascar and, uh, and uh, uh, East Africa. So you should have some familiarity uh, with where the Comoros are. I mean, you better at least know which, which ocean they're in. And further up north, you see the Seychelles, also very well known. And the uh, Andabar Islands, let's see. Well, I tell you what, um, we're just about finishing now, but what I want to do is show you an island where I really, really want to go. I mean, I've got a list of 20 places I would really, really like to go before I die. And some of them I've already been to, but there's still some I haven't. And right up here is the coolest of all. Now you see where it is. It's in between the Horn of Africa and the Arabian, uh, Arabian Peninsula. This is Socotra, variously spelled, well, they, uh, I'll just give you one spelling, S-O-C-A-T-R-A, -A, Socotra. And it is just the coolest, most, uh, you know, strangest place. So I've really got to go there. The trouble is that Socotra is administered by Yemen, and right now, Yemen is a very dangerous place to be. I mean, there, there, are, people, there are a lot of people there who shoot now and ask questions later. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of like being black in the United States, actually. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take another look at, uh, at Socotra. Uh, just, you know, so if you ever... And um, so it looks very dry, and it is. These are clouds, not, uh, not snow caps. But it looks very arid, and it is. Uh, it was cut off for the longest time because the seas in between uh, the Arabian Peninsula or the Horn of Africa and Socotra were, um, were fairly rough and uh, unpredictable and um, there, uh, there really wasn't much economic reason to go there. Um, so that, but when there's peace in Yemen, um, then uh, I hope to go there and uh, go to Yemen and to take either a boat or a uh, um, a boat or a plane to, uh, to Socotra and then I am going to be just so delighted because that's one of my one of my uh, my aims okay um, any question about any of that we're not um, I ran it through it really quite quickly um, any of them you want to see again are your brains full okay. yeah what's it like <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mike, is there anything else you want to bring up at this time? Not to say, just to ask you guys to make sure you keep an eye on your official emails, okay, because I will be contacting you through uh, my message, send a message to your official email. So make sure you check it through. It's a good idea to check it at a regular time every day. Uh, uh, okay, well, uh, we're done for now.